Oh, well, good morning, everybody. So glad to see all of you. Thanks for being here as we worship God together today, not only through our singing, but also through diving into God's word. I'm so excited to get to talk with you this morning about what he has to say. But before we do that, let me introduce myself. My name is Adam. If you're new here, and I've already met some new families today, I'm one of the pastors here at First Free Church. Thanks for being with us today and worshiping God with us, and we're excited to learn what he has to share with us. But also, we're excited for the Christmas season. I don't know how many of you enjoy Enjoy the Christmas season. I do. I love it. I love the lights. I love the food. I love the food a lot. Uh, but I also like, uh, you know, everything else that comes with Christmas time. How many of you just love Christmas? Like, this is an awesome time of the year for you. Like, yes, it's finally here. How many of you are like, bah humbug Scrooge, I could just be done with it. Yes, yeah, I'm already there. Like, take the lights down. We're done with it. This year was the first year that we uh, kind of went all out on Christmas lights. Our kids have been begging us to do this for years. And one of our neighbors kind of led the way and said, hey, what if we all decorated our houses for Christmas? And so we got all the Christmas lights out there. And and uh, they're colorful Christmas lights, which makes the kids happy. But with a push of a button, we can change them to just white. And that makes the adults happy. It just looks really nice. So we're really trying to get into the, uh, the Christmas spirit that way. We've got a lot of stuff going on at First Free Church here, too, as it, as it comes to the Christmas season. So I wanted to give you just a little bit of an overview in case you've missed some things. You can always go to efree.org slash weekly and get everything that's going on at the church. But there's so much happening. In case you didn't know, I wanted to share with you. So... The first one is, I'm sure you're all aware, Take Back Black Friday, where we are working to fund a church plant in Peru that we will then be able to go partner with on a long-term basis and send teams there and sponsor children there and do all kinds of amazing things there. That's our Take Back Black Friday offering. The main offering already took place, but we continue to accept additions to that, and already many of you have given to support that. There's also the Mission Gay Angel Tree Ministry back in the lobby there, uh, providing gifts for children of those who are incarcerated, wonderful ministry. Uh, we've already completed Operation Christmas Child, which provides gifts for children all over the world. And coming up, we've got a special family experience and kid connection where parents will be invited to, on December 19th, go down and be with their kids and do some fun crafts and things there. So we're excited about that. And there's also a Christmas play, Everyone's Christmas Story. Uh, Jenny and I are going to go to the showing today, but there are multiple showings. You can get tickets on our website at efree.org slash events to see the play. And on December 11th, we are, this is brand new, we are now going to be a theater location for Christmas with The Chosen. So uh, you, you might know The Chosen. How many of you have watched The Chosen? Phenomenal series. I cannot recommend it enough. And, and as someone who really gets into the historical nature of these things and the, and the historical context, it is so crazy accurate. It is scary how much research they have put into this show. It's, it's really amazing. It's all free to watch online. Well, their Christmas special is selling out in theaters all over the country. It's already broken records for that. Um, and so now they're opening it up for churches to be theater locations, and we will be one of those locations on December 11th. So you can get tickets. It is a ticketed event at efree.org slash tickets. It's just like going to the theater and watching it, only we'll be watching it here. The main difference being we encourage you to bring your own food in. So you are welcome to bring a meal. It's, it's going to happen at a time where you might want to have dinner. You can bring the family. You can eat together. We'll have tables set up, and you can watch the Christmas special. That same night, a little bit later, the Christmas play, Everyone's Christmas Story, is happening. So make it a double header. You can do both. You can go to the, the Christmas with the Chosen and then Everyone's Christmas Story, and it'll just be a Christmas-filled day for you. And if you're not sick of Christmas by then, maybe you will be. But I think it's going to be awesome. We have Christmas Eve services. I'll let you figure out what day that's going to be on. But the times are 4 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. right here in the auditorium. We will have a cookies and cocoa event for that as well. So there are a lot of things going on here at the church, and next week we're actually going to take a break from our first Timothy series and focus on more of a Christmas series called Arrival. Really excited about that. We're going to talk about a number of different aspects of Jesus coming to this earth and what that meant, so be sure to join us for all of that. But I may have missed something today as well. So if you want to know the latest about what is going on at First Free church, you can always find that out at efree.org slash weekly. That's efree.org slash weekly. And that is where we post all the latest stuff. You'll find our announcements there, plus a lot more, all of the events. So please take advantage of that and know what's going on, because there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. Well, today we are still going to be in 1 Timothy. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Feel free to open your Bibles there and get ready for it. 
But I want to talk a little bit while you're going there about kind of where we're going today. I'm going to talk about expectations. And in particular, I want to talk about God's expectations for his children. If you're a child of God, if you are a follower of, of Jesus and a part of his family, he has certain expectations for you, just like I have expectations for my kids. Um, God wants us to live a certain way, talk a certain way, think a certain way, act a certain way. And when those expectations aren't met, there's going to be a, a problem. We're going to talk about one very specific aspect of that today. But first, I just want to talk a little bit about expectations in general, because when our expectations are not met, it can be a pretty big letdown. And I remember one time uh, growing up when I was a kid, there was this girl in our church who made a bunch of cookies and brought them in. And she had them all in this tray, and she brought them around for people to have. And I noticed that she was only giving them to the boys, which seemed odd. She wouldn't even let the girls have them. No, they're only for the boys. And so all the boys got a cookie, and then all the boys bit into the cookie, and then we all found a big tablespoon of salt in the middle of the cookie, which explained why they were only going to the boys. A little practical joke. Reality did not meet our expectations that day, and we got a bad taste in our mouth. I remember another time, too, where um, this wasn't intentional, but my mom made muffins one morning, and the muffins were delicious, don't get me wrong. But my particular muffin had about a dime-sized, undissolved chunk of baking soda in it. Have you ever had pure baking soda? Baking soda is fantastic when it's incorporated in some kind of a baked good. But if you want to humor me today, just go home, find your baking soda, grab yourself a teaspoon, and just stick that in there. And you will have a sense for how I felt when I was a kid biting into that muffin. Oh, 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 it was terrible. I still to this day remember that taste vividly. And that's the only time I've ever, I've ever had a taste like that. But it still wasn't the worst experience I've had with food not meeting my expectations. The worst one was when I was an adult, so I didn't have much of an excuse for it. I think I was maybe a college student at the time. I opened the fridge, and there was a gallon container of chocolate milk. And I love chocolate milk. So I put it out, I pulled it out, and I poured myself a glass, and I started to down it. And I was about two gulps in, seriously, when I realized it was like several weeks sour. It was awful. Probably the worst taste I've ever had in my life. And reality did not meet my expectations. Well, God has expectations for his children as well on how he wants them to live and how he wants them to think and how he wants them to act. And when we don't meet his expectations, he says it's like there's a bad taste in his mouth, like he wants to spit us out of his mouth. I can show you in Revelation chapter... Um, Th uh, chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, Jesus is talking to a church in Laodicea, and he says, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And then he tells them why. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And then he says, I correct and discipline everyone I love. So to be diligent and turn from your indifference. This is a group of people who are gathered together as a church in Laodicea. And Jesus is saying, you are not meeting my expectations. I expect you to live and think and operate and talk a certain way. And yet you're not doing that. And so I will discipline everyone who I love. And in a way, when we're experiencing the discipline of God, that's, that's a reassuring thing. I've had people come and talk to me for counsel and say, I just feel like God is, is disciplining me. He's, he's doing all these things. And why is this happening to me? And I say, honestly, if you feel that way, that might be a really good sign. Because that means that he loves you. And that means that he's your child. And he wants to steer you back onto the right path. So listen, pay attention to it. God disciplines the ones who are not meeting his expectations because... They're people that he loves because they're people that he cares about and he wants to correct them onto the right path. God's ways are always better, right? God's ways are always better for us. Even when we don't feel like it, even when we don't understand them, God's ways are always better. And so it is a loving thing for God to correct us when we're not meeting those expectations because the alternative is for us to go down a very bad path. If Jesus is in your life, your life should look different. And that's the title of my message for today. If Jesus is in your life, if Jesus is in your life, your life should look different. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. 
And in Ephesians, Paul says, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. That means from the inside out, you've got to be made a new person. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. If you are a child of God, you are a new creation. And so you should act like it. There are some expectations for you. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6 today, we need to understand that Paul is talking about the expectation that Christians are going to behave differently than other people in a very specific aspect of life. He's operating from a baseline, a foundation of understanding that he's writing to people that are believers in Jesus, whose lives have been transformed by Jesus. And so the way they operate in this world should be different. Here's what he says in chapter 1, verse 15. He says, this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. Paul is saying, look, my life was terrible before Jesus. You wouldn't believe how bad. And in other letters, he explains all the things that he did that he thought were good back then, but were really terrible things to do. And then he tells Timothy in Ephesus, but God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Even the worst of sinners like me, Paul says, God wants to come to know him. Why? Because then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. It is open for everybody, no matter how bad your life has been, no matter what sin you've been involved in, no matter what someone has done to you, no matter how unredeemable you think that you are, God wants you to know. And so he sets Paul up as an example that yes, yes, you can have eternal life. You can have a relationship with God if you believe in Jesus Christ. See, Paul's is a life that has been radically transformed from a terrible person into an amazing child of God. Not perfect, still struggling in certain ways, and he admits that in his letters. But what a radical transformation that he had, and that's an example to us. He sets himself up as an example of how one can be changed and transformed for the better by knowing Jesus. Not only does trusting in Jesus change our eternal destination, but it also changes our life here and now. And that's what Paul wanted people to see. I was the worst of sinners. Look at how different my life is now. He can do that for you too. But that means there's an expectation that our life looks different after we trust in Jesus. So the message is called, if Jesus is in your life, how should our life look different? We're going to look at a very specific aspect of that today, and it's going to feel uncomfortable at first. I'm going to warn you, okay? If you're already in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and you cheated and you looked ahead, you know why. We're going to read 1 Timothy 6, 1 through 3 right now. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. All slaves should show full respect for their masters, so they will not bring shame on the name of God and his teaching. If the masters are believers, that is no excuse for being disrespectful. Those slaves should work all the harder because their efforts are helping other believers who are well-loved. Teach these things, Timothy, and encourage everyone to obey them. Some people may contradict our teaching, but these are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. Hey, before we do anything else, would you just bow your heads with me and pray and ask God to, to teach us through this message time? Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand your word in a fresh way today. Help us to apply it to our lives. Even though this was written 2,000 years ago, and even though at first glance it comes across in an awkward way to our ears, I pray, God, that you would help us to see the principles in it, to understand the historical context behind it, and to see how it applies to each and every one of us in, in different ways, Lord. I know that sometimes your word can be difficult to understand, and, and Paul in particular, and I, I so appreciate Peter, in his, one of his letters, he said, some of the things Paul wrote were difficult to understand, and that's true, but Lord, I pray that you'd help us to get a grasp on it today, and to know how we can apply your word to our life this week, so that we can represent you well, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I got to be honest with you, this is not one of those passages that any pastor says, I just love to preach on this. If I could preach more on the slavery stuff, that would be great. Because let's be honest, this does not sound good. This does not sound like a good passage. 
Paul is saying, hey, slaves, you, you need to work hard for your masters. Like, what? How, how could you say that, Paul? I mean, how is that possibly a good thing to do? Shouldn't Paul be saying, hey, you need to fight for freedom and you need to subvert the hierarchy and you need to, to, to get rid of this oppression, you need to throw this off, and what, why on earth does it seem like Paul is endorsing this? And I actually want us to sit with that tension a little bit because it's not an easy question to answer. Now, some of you who were here last January may remember another message very similar to this passage on Colossians. Paul says something a little bit different there, but it's close enough that we had a message that, that explained, and if you're remembering that, you're remembering all of the, the context that we're going to talk about in a minute. I went into more detail back then. But many of you are new, and you may not have heard, never have heard this before. And let's be honest, the reason why many people run away from the faith is because of passages like this that are misunderstood or poorly explained or that Christians don't seem to have an answer for. How could you trust in a God who makes a holy book that says slavery is okay? Why does it seem like the Bible endorses slavery? Why would the Bible encourage slaves to work hard for their masters and show respect for them? How can that possibly be a good God who would do that? And I do want you to appreciate the tension of that. But I also want you to know we have really good answers for this. And that the Bible is often misunderstood because we read it with Western eyes and we read it with 21st century eyes. And we don't take the time to think about who was this written to, when was it written, and what did the world look like back then? So without going back and covering everything I did almost a year ago when we went through our study of Colossians, that's the Rooted series. You can look it up online. There's a message called Christianity in the Workplace under the Rooted series. It'll go into more detail than I will here. But let me just give you a brief summary of that so you can understand what are we talking about as we work through this letter to Timothy. Paul says all slaves should show full respect. And many versions will translate this as bond servant. And the reason they do that is because they want you to know that this does not mean the same kind of slavery that we would think of today. We have a history in this country, an experience that, that clouds our understanding of what this may have meant in the, in the past, in the distant past. And so we perceive it through our lens as being a really terrible thing. Forced slavery, people forced into slavery, people taken from their homes in another country and brought over on ships and forced into, into a horrible atrocity of being owned by other people and living on plantations and, and doing work and being treated in horrible ways many times. And that's a terrible, horrible thing. And so we read the Bible and we have that understanding and we think, I can't believe the Bible is talking about that in this way. That's not what the Bible is talking about. The, the idea of a slave in the Bible is a much broader concept than what we would think of today. And so some translations would say this is a bond servant because they want you to understand this is not necessarily forced slavery. Here's just a little bit of context for you. Being a bond servant or a slave in Bible times was a very common thing. It was normal. In fact, historians estimate that 50% of the Roman Empire was in this kind of arrangement that they were some sort of a slave or bond servant. It was a very normal thing for them. It was to be under contract, basically, as a contract worker, but, but with a lot of expectations and some ownership there. It's certainly not something we're used to today, but it was extremely common back then. In fact, it was something that the Roman politicians were worried about because the slaves back then, the bond servants, whatever you want to call them, just looked like everybody else. It had nothing to do with race. It was not based on some, some race being uh, put in a lower status than anyone else. It was a status thing, but it was an economic status thing, not a race-based status thing. And so there were certain people who, because of their life circumstances, would oftentimes need to sell themselves into bond servanthood because it was their version of bankruptcy. If you started a business and it didn't work out, then your way to get out of that debt was to go become a bond servant to someone. And you might do that for a period of time, a certain number of years that would be agreed upon, and then you would have your freedom back. And that was a, a very normal arrangement. It was so normal, it was so common, that the Roman politicians started to become concerned um, that you couldn't tell who these people were. They looked like everybody else. They looked like any other Roman citizen in many cases, or any other foreign national, or whatever it would be. There was all these different people that were slaves, they were of a lower economic status, but you couldn't tell. 
because they dressed like everybody else. There was no visible indicator. You can see this is very different than what we think of as slavery today, particularly in this country. And so one of the senators had a proposal. He wrote up a bill that said that all people who were bond servants would have to wear something like a ribbon or something so that they could identify who they were. And that way everyone would know, oh, you're a, you're a bond servant. Okay, you're a, you're a little lesser status than me. He wanted everybody to know that because status meant a lot to them. The other politicians, the other senators rejected that bill. And here's why. Because there were so many of them, they feared that if any of them were to look around and be able to see this indicator, because you usually didn't know if somebody was a bond servant, if they were, were to look around and see, oh, wow, there's a lot of us in this particular arrangement. Like, there's like, like half of us at least that are, that are somehow in this bond servant contract with someone who kind of has ownership over us because of our economic situation. And if that happened, they were afraid that they would essentially unionize. They would see each other and they'll go, oh, wow, there's a whole bunch of us here. Hey, if we joined together, we would have a lot of power. And they might just be able to bargain and, and, and do some things. And so really, the, the Senate decided because of how many of these people there were and how normal it was and how you couldn't tell who they were because they looked like everybody else, that they, they wanted to identify them, but then they decided it was a risky idea and they didn't do it. Do you see how this is very different than what you may have walked in today thinking about slavery? You can't equate the two. You can't read our understanding of the 21st century back into Paul's letter. That's very, very important here. It's a different kind of thing. The Bible, in fact, condemns forced slavery. In Exodus 21, in Deuteronomy 15, in Deuteronomy 24, even in 1 Timothy 1.10, Paul talks about slave trading, that's forced slavery, as being an evil, and the people that are involved in that is going to hell. And so when Paul talks about slaves and masters here, even though the terminology sounds so bad to our ears, you have to understand this was a normal employment relationship for so many people. And in fact, probably most of the people in the church were either in some kind of a bondservant situation or they had bondservants. This is describing one of the dominant contracts of employment that existed in the empire at that time, especially because there was no normal social safety net and there was no method of bankruptcy other than to sell yourself as a bond servant. So I hope that that gives you a little bit of a better understanding of what Paul's talking about here. If you want to know more, you can go back and watch the message from last January. It goes into more detail about that. There's a lot of things I'm not going to include here. But with that understanding now, we can understand that what Paul is talking about is not so much slaves and masters in the way you and I hear those words, but more employees and employers. Because this was the, the predominant method of a contract that was used in so many ways for who was working for who. It's really talking about who is in charge and who is being given orders. Who is the boss, who is the supervisor, and who is the one that has to take orders? That's the principle that Paul is talking about here. He's using terminology, or we translate this as terminology, that makes it difficult for us to understand that. But there are principles here that we can take and apply in any situation where someone is, under, is in authority over us. Maybe they're your boss. Maybe they're your team leader. Maybe they're your supervisor. There's someone that you have to report to, someone that can give you instructions or orders in some way who has authority over you. And there are some great principles for us to learn here. So let me give you four of them. Four principles that you can learn. And, and the way I'm going to phrase this is, if Jesus is in your life at work, if Jesus is in your life at work, what should you do? First of all, if Jesus is in your life at work, you'll show respect for your employer. You'll show respect for your employer. Paul says all slaves, or we could say bond servants, or we could really just say employees, should show full respect for their masters, their bosses, their supervisors. Now, this can be a very hard thing to do, right? It is not an easy thing with some people. What's easy is to find fault with people, especially people that get to tell you what to do. It's really easy to find fault with those people. What's not easy is to give them the benefit of the doubt. The reality is oftentimes with your boss, with your supervisor, you don't know the full context of the situation. They've given you something to do, and maybe they didn't explain it as well as they could have. Maybe there's more information they could have shared with you, but there's probably some reasons for why they're doing what they're doing, most likely. And we jump to conclusions and we assume their motives and we assume that they're just being nasty to us. But sometimes there's a lot of context behind that that we don't have and maybe we don't need to have or maybe would like to have. But we need to give the benefit of the doubt. That's an aspect of showing respect for our employers. Sometimes we have to realize that that person who's giving us orders, maybe they're doing it in not a very nice way. 
And we might feel very poorly toward them because of that, but the reality is we don't know what's going on in their home. We don't know what's happening with their relationships, with their parents, with their spouse, with their kids. We don't know what's going on with their friends. We don't know the kind of difficulties they may be facing that could be causing the bad attitude in their life. Maybe if we knew that, maybe if we understood that, we'd have a little more empathy for them, a little more respect for them, even when they say something in a way that we don't like. And so we have to keep that in mind. And even if they're doing something that's criminally wrong, that that they should not be doing, we can still report them and yet be respectful to them. We can still let the proper authorities know or let the people higher up in the company know or whatever it is, and yet not do things that would disparage them or slander them in a way that would be inappropriate or speak poorly to them in person. We can still show respect to people and at the same time try to make sure that what is right is done. You can can talk to your boss, your supervisor, and say, hey, I, I really don't appreciate the way you did this. But there's a way to do that well and there's a way to do that poorly. Uh, you can you can show them respect in how you communicate to them in saying, maybe I'm wrong, but I perceived it this way. Instead of going to them and saying, I can't believe you. What's wrong with you? Why would you think this way? You're so stupid. And you certainly shouldn't do that behind their back. Show respect for your employer. Number two, if Jesus is in your life at work, you'll represent God at work. You'll represent God at work. Paul says that the reason we need to show full respect is so that we will not bring shame on the name of God and his teaching. That means that God views your behavior at work as a representation of him. And we often think of our lives in these separate circles, don't we? Like, I have my church life over here, and I have my home life over here, and I have my work life over here, and and they never touch. There's just these different areas. And the reality is that if Jesus is in our life, then he needs to be touching all of those areas. He needs to be infused in all of those areas. We should look like a different person in those areas. From God's perspective at work, you represent him. People should know there's something different about you because you follow Jesus. They should see someone who is growing in maturity and in character and in love for other people and showing respect and and integrity, not someone who is argumentative, who always tries to get their own way, even if they do it in a kind of a shifty way. Not someone who's willing to do whatever it takes to get ahead. Not someone who slanders people that they don't like, but someone who shows respect if Jesus is in your life. You'll represent God at work. Number three, if Jesus is in your life at work, you'll not use your faith as a reason to take advantage of others. Paul says if the masters are believers, that's no excuse for being disrespectful. That's no excuse. It might be easy to think, well, because they're a believer, they just need to turn the other cheek. They need to forgive me what was it, 490 times, right? Seven times 70, like they need to forgive me again and again so I can kind of slack off, I can do whatever. And Paul says, no, you can't, you can't be disrespectful to them just because they are a Christian. Instead, number four, if Jesus is in your life at work, you'll work even harder because you're helping other believers. Here's where he says that. It's no excuse for being disrespectful if they're a Christian, but those slaves, bond servants, employees should work all the harder because their efforts are helping other believers who are well-loved. Jenny and I used to own uh, rental properties before, and it was a great way to supplement ministry income um, at the time. And we did that for many years. And I, I hate to say this, but do you know who the worst renters were? People that went to my church. They were always, in fact, we didn't even want to let people know. Like, ah, we're looking for a place to stay. We need to rent somewhere. Like, "Mm, we don't want you. We want people that don't go to our church. Why? Because people that don't go to our church pay rent on time. People that don't go to our church don't wait several months of not paying rent, all the while we're paying the mortgage. People that don't go to our church don't expect us to come over and fix every broken light bulb, every little tiny thing. But when your landlord is your pastor, well, there's a lot of expectation that comes there that maybe isn't appropriate. Why? Because we can take advantage sometimes of other Christians in a way that's inappropriate. And Paul is saying here, don't do that. That's not the way to operate. Don't take advantage of other people just because they're Christians. Treat them fairly. Treat believers well. Pay them what they're worth. Give them the respect that you should. Don't slack off if they're your employer just because they're a Christian. Don't take advantage of other Christians. So how are we going to apply Paul's words this week? Well, maybe 
you have a boss or a supervisor or a team leader or something like that, someone who is in a position of authority over you who you really don't like. And I'm sure that's not the case, but you know, maybe there's one person here that that, that applies to you. What are you gonna do this week to show them respect? Is there something that you can point out and give them credit for? Is there some way that you can encourage them? And I don't mean encourage them passive aggressive, like, hey, it was really nice of you to finally replace the coffee this time. You know, like really genuinely something you can encourage them for. Like I noticed you did a great job when you did this. I know for some people that is going to be like the hardest thing you've done in the last year to say something encouraging to your boss that you can't stand. But how can you show respect for the people that are in authority over you? Even if you disagree with them, even if you don't like them, even if they're not very nice to you, can you be different? If Jesus is in your life, can you be different in how you function, how you operate with them and showing them that respect and being gracious with them? Again, not overlooking wrongdoings, not saying we don't report things that are wrong or confront issues when they're there or, or openly disagree when it's appropriate, but to always do so with love and respect. Maybe you're part of a team or some kind of a group where with someone who's not really your boss, but they are in kind of a position of authority and leadership, and you just disagree with the way they're running everything. They're just doing a bad job. Is that all you're going to see them as? Are you going to view their faults and their flaws as being the sum total of everything that makes up what they do? Or is it possible that maybe that's a percentage of their leadership, but there are some things they're doing that are really well too? Try to give people the benefit of the doubt. Give them the respect of saying, you know what? There's actually some really good things that you're doing. And I can appreciate that and respect that. And I can go along with that, even though I may disagree with this portion over here. We need to try to be respectful people, people of integrity. If the people that you work with were to find out that you're a Christian, would it surprise them? Would it surprise them to know that, oh, you, you're one of those people. You go to church, you follow Jesus. Would that be a shock? I hope not. Or if for some reason it was a surprise to them, or they just didn't know, and they found out that you're a Christian, would their reaction be, oh, that explains it? Because you act differently than everybody else. I knew there was something different about you. You're always so nice. You're encouraging. You never participate in all the gossip that everybody else does. You don't use crafty, shifty means to get ahead at work. You always act with integrity and respect for other people. Like, you're just different than everybody else. And then you can say, yeah, it's because of Jesus. He transformed my life. He made me into a different person. I have different desires, different thoughts, different actions. And as I surrender to that, he makes me into a better person. He transforms me from the inside out. If Jesus is in your life, it should make a difference in how you live, in how you operate at home, and in how you operate at work. Let me pray for you and pray that we can do this together. Heavenly Father, uh, what seems like a challenging and, and difficult to understand passage really, I think, just speaks to your desire for us to interact with other people in a way that represents you well. And God, help us to do that. Lord, I think of uh, the, the command to not take your name in vain. And it's so often misunderstood to me, not, not saying your name in a disrespectful way, but really it means to not take on your name as if we're a representative of you and then not live it out properly. As the Israelites were taking your name and saying that, they, that you were their God and then not, not living that out. And Lord, we don't want to be guilty of that. We don't want to take your name in vain. We want to represent you well, not just when we're around other Christians, but when we're at work too, in every kind of relationship that we have. And so I pray that you would help us to do that, Lord. Help us this week to find ways that we can show respect for those who are in authority over us, even if we don't particularly care for them. I pray, God, that you would help us to, to treat other believers well and not take advantage of them. Help us to be people of integrity that operate differently, that look differently because of the difference that you have made in our lives, Lord. Because of the, the sacrifice that you made for us. Because you died on the cross. Because you took away our sin. You take away the penalty of our sin. And then you give us your righteousness so that we can be restored to you. God, thank you for everything you have done for us. Help us to live like it makes a difference. To live like we're surrendered to, to someone who knows better how we should live our lives than we do. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The last thing we're going to do today is take the Lord's Supper together. And it's a, a wonderful thing that we get to do uh, but we're going to do it a little bit differently than we sometimes do. 
we've been doing this the last couple of months. I just want to explain it in case anyone is new so that you know what we're doing and why. You know, the way we do communion today in churches is totally different than how most churches did it in the early New Testament times. In the early New Testament times, they would gather for a meal in somebody's home, and then at some point during the meal, someone would take a loaf of bread, and they would pass it around, and everybody would break off a chunk. And that was how they, they took the body in communion. And then somebody would take a cup of wine, and they would drink from it, and they would pass it around, and everybody would drink from it. And that was how they did communion back in the early church days. Well, somewhere along the line, that got changed into us taking communion together in our weekend gatherings. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. The Bible doesn't prescribe a method of the Lord's Supper. Jesus just said, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. It doesn't say whether it's okay to pass trays through the pews or to come up and get it in a line or to do it in a home. We do it in lots of different ways in different circumstances. Typically here at this church, we have passed trays through pews. And that's not a biblical thing. That's just a convenience thing. It's a lot easier for this many people to not try to hand a loaf of bread through every row and, and pass it all the way. Or one cup to get passed from one person to another. That's probably not a good idea, we think. And that's okay. The Bible doesn't prescribe that. But right now, we're not even going to pass trays. Because of the pandemic that we're in and not being ready to go back to doing that just yet, we're doing things a little differently. Honestly, the way we're going to do it today is the way many churches have done it for a long time. At the end of a service, they have communion stations where each person gets up and personally goes and reflects on the sacrifice that Jesus made for them. And then they take the bread and they take the cup. And that's what we're going to do today. And, and, and I don't know how much longer we'll do that, but we're doing that for now just to make sure that everybody is, stays very safe and there's no kind of risk of contamination there. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'm going to read some scripture in a minute. And I'm going to invite you to just spend a couple of minutes reflecting, praying, confessing sin, making sure your heart is right with God. And when you're ready, uh, if you're up for it, get in line at one of our communion stations. And you are going to pick up a stack of cups like this. They're separated from each other and kind of individually packaged to make it easy for you to just touch yours and nothing else. No one else is touching yours. The bottom cup has the bread and the top cup has the juice representing the blood. And what you can do is you can separate these and you can pause for a minute and you can pray. And you can do this with a, a spirit of thankfulness and just say, thank you, Jesus, for your body that was broken for me. And then take the bread and say, thank you, Jesus, for your blood that was shed for me and take the cup and just reflect on the sacrifice Jesus made for you. This will be as intentional as you make it. And, and with your sincerity and your intentionality and in thinking about Jesus' sacrifice, the freshness and the differentness of doing it this way can actually be a wonderful thing to make us really think about why we're doing this. It's not about the method. It's not about passing trays. It's not about the how. It's about the who died for us and what a difference that makes in our life and making sure we never forget it. If you're at home right now, watch it online, you may want to pause the video right now so you can go get yourself some bread and some juice or, or water or whatever. The elements themselves aren't prescribed. It's not what's important. What's important is doing this practice to remember what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Something to represent the body and something to represent the blood. Let me read some scripture to you. This is from Matthew chapter 26. Matthew writes, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it, he gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Jesus, we remember your sacrifice today. We thank you for everything you've done for us to allow us to live this transformed life, to be different. Not because, just because we have this eternal life ahead with you, which we so look forward to, Lord but also because we can live differently now. And like Paul, we can be an example of how you have changed our lives. Help us to do that this week, God. May this time of communion, this special time, be a reminder of what you did and a reminder of how that should make us different. Thank you for shedding your blood for us. Thank you for allowing your body to be broken for us, for showing the great lengths that you would go in order to restore us to you. We praise you, God, for being a good God who loves us and cares us enough to die for us. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Take a moment and when you're ready, approach one of our communion stations 
take communion and then quietly exit the auditorium and connect in the lobby.